congregation, the text for the sermon this morning is the first verse of Psalm 133, 133, verse 1. Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. Beloved congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters, boys and girls, let me introduce the sermon with, uh, on the first verse of 133 then by pointing to the last words of this psalm, the last half of verse 3. It says there, For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. And notice, you have to notice there that it says, The Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. And that expresses, that, that expresses certainty if it's a command. Because when God commands something, it's going to happen. Think of how God spoke in the beginning at creation. And he, he commanded, and it, it came to be out of nothing. Just as he commanded. And, and so when God commands blessing and life forevermore, it will happen. It will happen. There's nothing and no one that can hold that back. No man, no devil can stop that blessing and life forevermore from coming about. And upon whom or what does the Lord command that blessing and life forevermore? On one place and one place only, and that's where brothers, and we can then, of course, include the sisters here too, where they dwell in unity. That's where God commands blessing and life forevermore. So it's important that we consider that as church, as communion of saints, as brothers and sisters in Christ. Also, as you look ahead to the Lord's Supper celebration, which is an expression of the unity of the congregation. And I proclaim to you the word of God as we find it in the first verse of Psalm 133 with the words of that verse, how good and pleasant it is when brothers, and we could include sisters, dwell in unity. We'll pay attention to three things in respect, with respect to those brothers and sisters and they have one father they have one dwelling place and they have one desire so first of all they have one father above psalm 133 it says it's a song of a sense david wrote this as for people who were going up to jerusalem to worship and to to celebrate the feasts they came from all over and they Israelites gathered in Jerusalem then, in Zion, and they came together around the temple later on. First of all, there was the tent, but later the temple. City and temple were full of pilgrims then. And those pilgrims were not all strangers from each other, even though they came from various places, even distant places they saw themselves as brothers and sisters of one another. And that, that's how it is in the church of the Lord. We are brothers and sisters of one another. Just like the Lord Jesus Christ put it in Mark 3, for whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister. The church consists of brothers and sisters. And that bond is even more important than the biological bond. So what does that mean then that you're all brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters in a family don't always get along together perfectly? Maybe you've experienced that in your own family that you fight with your biological brother or sister usually about nothing really. Treat them badly then, worse than you, even worse than you treat your friends. And why do you treat them worse than your friends? Well, because your friends, you can always say to you, well, I'm not going to be your friend anymore. I'm, I'm out of here. But your biological brother or sister can never say to you, I'm not going to be your brother or sister anymore. They'll always remain your brother and sister, your biological brothers and sisters. You have that special bond with them that cannot be broken, even if you lose contact with a brother or sister They'll always remain your biological brother or sister. 
Well, you have a similar bond with one another in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're all brothers and sisters of one another, all adopted into God's family through God's grace in Jesus Christ. Of course, as you know of ourselves, we're all worthy of the eternal, eternal punishment in hell along with the rest of mankind. We don't really, by nature, anymore belong in God's family. We're all individuals on death row, so to speak. We all fall short of the perfect holiness and the love which God requires of us every day. We heard that in the covenant law. But then he, the righteous judge, says, I've appointed my son to take the full punishment for all your sins and shortcomings in your place so that you can be adopted into my family and live with me instead of ending up being cast into eternal darkness with Satan and his host. I made that agreement with my son to adopt you into our family, and you can live in my house, eat at my table, be heir of all things along with my son, and I will be your loving and eternal and faithful father with a capital F. And that's awesome if you think about that, right? So many people in the world today only see this world and, and this life, and that's it. They don't believe anything more than you can see and, and hear and touch. And so they basically live by their own thoughts and desires and emotions and chance, and they don't realize they're actually on a, on a sinking ship. Unless they repent, they're destined to sink into eternal darkness and terror far away from God. But of all people, God called you, you, called you, brought you to Christ. Many of us in our biological family context, too. Promise to you and to your children, born and raised in the covenant with God's gracious promises. It was signified and sealed at your baptism that God the Father established an eternal covenant of grace with you and adopted you for his children and heirs. And along with a lot of others, because God has many more children, he adopted them all as his children in Christ. And they're all your brothers and sisters in God's covenant family. And it's a miracle that you of all people can belong to that family. Right? You acknowledge that. Amazing that in this broken world, I may belong to God the Father's family, the family of the Almighty God and Creator, and even if I had to take the lowliest spot in that family, I'd still be so thankful to be part of that family. I may belong to God's spiritual house, his church, where I'm spiritually cared for and fed by my Father in heaven with his word of promise. If that's how you see it, you'll always be a thankful and faithful child of God in his family then everything the Lord gives in the congregation is wonderful to you. You want it. You lap it up. Every word in the Sunday sermon and in the worship, every baptism, every Lord's Supper celebration, every home visit, you thirst for it. Sadly, though, we, we can so easily get used to everything in church, can't we? And then... For us, the sermons kind of become run-of-the-mill. Sacraments are just rituals. And it can be that you start getting critical about what goes on in, in worship. Just all too boring. Needs to be spiced up. And then you lose the amazement. Then you've actually lost the amazement that of all people, God has brought you into his family with all the other brothers and sisters around you. And that he feeds you with his word. See, the, the thing with brothers and sisters of the same biological family is that they didn't choose each other. 
It's actually the same with God's family in Christ. You didn't choose these brothers and sisters here. You can choose your friends. Your friends share the same interests with you. You like their character. You agree with their view. But you don't choose your brothers and sisters in Christ. God gave them to you, adopted them in Christ as his children, just like he adopted you out of grace into his covenant family. Single people, parents and their children, old and young, all God's family, brothers and sisters of one another. And as I mentioned, that, that being spiritual brothers and sisters is an even stronger bond than being biological brothers and sisters. Biological brothers and sisters can sometimes become estranged and then they, they don't communicate with each other anymore, sometimes never again. You hear about that sometimes. But the spiritual bond is unbreakable. It's a bond of common love for our brother, our big brother, Jesus Christ. And that love for him always will translate into love for one another. And that's expressed for instance, at the Lord's Supper celebration. Brothers and sisters, boys and girls too, you all belong to this family of God in Emmanuel Church here. And then, and then I ask you, what kind of a family member are you? Are you a member of this family in name only or also in heart? Have you professed your faith out of tradition only or out of sincere love for your Lord and your God and his family too? Do you look forward to attending the Lord's Supper? Because you seek your life outside of yourself and Jesus Christ together with all the others of the congregation? Or is it just a custom? Do you love being member of God's family? And do you love the brothers and sisters he has given you in this family? You look forward to seeing them. And for example, do you seek good connection with them then? And reconciliation when that connection might somehow be damaged? And do you, do you give when the deacons collect for brothers and sisters in need? After all, you're all brothers and sisters of the same family. We have the same gracious, loving Father in Jesus Christ. And then the well-being of all the brothers and sisters in every way will be close to your heart, won't it? We come to the second part of the sermon. They have one dwelling place. So we see that they have one father, they have one dwelling place then too. Our text says, behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. And dwelling implies that they live together. In other words, they have one address. That's, that's how it's supposed to be, isn't it? The family lives under the same roof. Eats at the same table. Live together in one place as one family. And that's why it's so painful when there's deep division in the church about opinions, things which aren't specifically required in Scripture or agreed upon by the churches in the church order, or when people simply withdraw from the church for selfish reasons. It's painful. And it should remain painful. You see, brothers and sisters in the Lord will want to dwell together in unity. In one place, in other words. And our text doesn't point to a temporary place to stay then. The word dwell doesn't imply a temporary place. Like a hotel. You go to a hotel and you leave after a while. And if the staff isn't nice and the bed sleeps poorly, you leave earlier than you planned. You have the right to do that. No problem. But it's different when you dwell with brothers and sisters. Dwelling implies permanence, home with them. And even 
when there are sometimes differences between brothers and sisters, you don't just leave because you don't like some of them anymore. Or you don't like the way this or that is done among the brothers and sisters, maybe in worship. No, a family belongs together in one home. So it is with the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Even if you have to move due to circumstances, you seek to belong to your father's family in the place you move to. Or you even think about that beforehand. Where's the father's family? Or even if you simply travel somewhere else, you seek out the family in the place you're visiting. The thing is, congregation belonging to the father's family calls for faithfulness to that family. You defend your father. And John Calvin called the church our mother in line with Galatians 4, verse 26. So in, in love, you also stand up for your mother. And you dearly love your brothers and sisters, even if they aren't always so nice and they have irritating habits and don't always agree with your opinions. You stay faithful, even if you don't always get your way, even if you wish some things were different, because it's a dwelling place. Of course, if you're not being fed with the truth of the word anymore, if you're not being treated as family member, then you realize, actually, this is not the father's family anymore. And then you need to leave in order to stay with the family. And then there's something else to living with brothers and sisters in your father's house, family, in, in the family in the house of the father. In a hotel, you know, you meet people in the lobby or in the hall as you're moving around. And you say hello to them, you're friendly, but then you walk on. You don't have much to do with those other people and they don't have much to do with you. There's no real connections. You each, each lead separate lives. But that's different in the dwelling place of the Father where brothers dwell in unity. In a, in a family, you converse with one another, you tell one another all kinds of things. You commune with one another. At table, during mealtimes, for instance, you get to know each other as you really are, also one another's weaknesses. And in a family, you experience things together. You Celebrations, death, sickness. And then you pull together as a family. Support one another. You're involved with each other. You encourage and comfort each other. In a, in a family, you also correct each other as brothers and sisters. And you miss a brother or sister if they're not there at table, for instance. Hey, where's my brother? Where's my sister? And see, that's all, I could say that's all implied in that word dwelling in the text. You live together as brothers and sisters in God's family. You tell each other all kinds of things. You commune with each other about spiritual matters, for instance, Bible study. You don't want to be or remain strangers to one another. Talk with one another about what you experienced. Worship services, sermons, talk about those things. Ask or give advice on how to live as God's children. Talk about your struggles. How should I do this? How can I, can I fix that? You correct one another out of love for each other. You help one another. Isn't, isn't, that, isn't taking part in that going to bring you farther away from your father in heaven and from his family? You ask, hey, if you take part, you ask a brother or sister that. If you go there, isn't that going to bring you farther away from the family? And then as brothers and sisters, you also miss someone if they hardly or never are there when the family can be together. A young person, maybe, who doesn't come home anymore. You seek him or her out in love as brother or sister to remind them that the father wants them to be with the family. And the brothers and sisters love them. Congregation, let that love be among all of you here. True brotherly sisterly love and care 
that love is, as it says, verses 2 and 3 of the psalm, like the precious oil or like the dew of Hermon, which runs down. Notice that it comes down from above, that dew. It comes from God himself through Jesus Christ, our big brother. He came to seek and save. He wasn't ashamed to call us brothers and sisters, it says in Hebrews. He gave his life for his brothers and his sisters when they were still sinners. He remained faithful when people despised him and hated him for speaking the word of his father. He remained true and loving even when they arrested him and beat him. He is love kept you too in his heart when he was whipped, crucified. And so love comes down from him from above. We need to receive that from him via his word and spirit. Every Sunday when the gospel is open, he sends his spirit down to work his love in your heart. And when you open the Bible at home, and you notice then, I need his spirit to work that love in my heart and to keep it there. It's not there by nature. I, I need it from him. I want to be with a family when the gospel is opened and the spirit pours out Christ's gifts so that I can learn to love the brothers and sisters too more and more. So I can overcome myself. And yes, whoever gives away little love isn't going to need to receive much from above, but whoever shows love towards others will want to take in more love from the gospel of God's love in Christ as much as they can so that they can live more and more in love. And that brings us to the last part of the sermon. The brothers and sisters also have that one desire. How good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters live in unity. It's, a wonderful, it's wonderful to dwell in the same house. But if there's conflict and quarreling, it can be an extremely unhappy place. But how good and pleasant it is when there is unity in the church, in the Lord's family. And you know where that unity in that family shows, where unity in a family in general shows in particular? In the eating and drinking together. In sharing a meal together. Mom calls a family in together for supper. Dinner's ready. And they all come. Everyone comes together. And you can compare the consistory to a mother like that. Eh? They call the family together here. Elders and ministers have the responsibility to serve the food and drink of eternal life here. And ensure that the word is faithfully and truthfully served here. And they ensure that the sacraments are administered according to that word. And that's what binds you all together here. That one gospel of Jesus Christ crucified for sinners. And yes, singing the same songs together with heart and mouth in the worship services confirms that. And praying together and giving offerings for the needs of brothers and sisters here and farther away. All those things you unite outwardly but also inwardly. And then we're all united in our purpose too. United in seeking the glory of our Father in heaven. That's our desire then. The desire of everyone to hold our Father's name high in everything. Pursuing holiness. To be holy as He is holy. Holiness in lifestyle, in walk and talk. In the families, in the congregation, in the community. One goal, one desire and then also united in caring about and for the Father in Heaven's family. All the members of the family have the well-being of the whole family at heart, so everyone has their calling. One is good at this and the other at something else. The Apostle Paul talks about that in Ephesians 4. It's like your own family. Everybody has their own skill set and pulls together to make things work. And it can't be then that there are family members who never do anything. They say, well, they hang back, don't do anything. What are your strengths? What can you do with what you have for the well-being of God's family? 
that's going to live in you then because you desire to glorify God in that family and with that family. Maybe you, you can't do very much. Maybe all you can do is pray, but prayer is actually a great work that especially binds the family of God together in unity. It's, it's good if on Saturday evening you also pray for a blessed Sunday for the whole congregation that everybody may, may be there and fed also online or here that they may be fed and that the spirit may work mightily in everyone through the word and the sacraments and work that love of Christ in their hearts. And if you pray that that person who's been missing so often might be back with the family on Sunday again. And you pray for growth in membership from within and also from outside the church and for catechism classes. And seniors, you have a, maybe a less skills or abilities. You have a special calling in this regard. Pray for God's family. You have the time. Oh, to be brothers and sisters dwelling in unity like that congregation. If we want to know more about what that means, we have to look at our big brother, Jesus Christ. He loved his father perfectly. He knew him perfectly and loved him perfectly. You see that with him when, uh, what it, with him, hey, you see that with him with what it means to seek our father's glory and everything. He did that all the time he was on earth sought the glory of his Father in heaven. And his food was to do his Father's will. He listened to his Father, and that was what he wanted to do. And he did that even when he was despised for it. Something to think about. He always sought the well-being of God's people, God's family. He encouraged, but he also admonished because he was seeking the well-being of the family. He gave himself for his father's family. Prayed constantly for it. How often aren't we told that he withdrew to a place to pray, a quiet place to pray, the Lord Jesus. And you can be sure he didn't only pray for himself and his own wants and needs. He prayed for the family. Our desire and our prayer ought to be that his spirit may conform us to his image, O Lord. Make us all more and more like you in love and desire. Wonderful if you think about it. To be all brothers and sisters of one another in this church. That you dwell together here, one in heart and one in desire. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, says Paul. But one desire too. For as it says in the last verse of Psalm 30, 133, there the Lord has commanded blessing. Where brothers and sisters dwell in unity. Their blessing is commanded by the Lord. And that blessing is like the oil poured on Aaron's head, which runs down to his beard and clothing, soaks him completely. It was a very fragrant oil, anointing oil, pleasing odor to God, but also pleasing to other people. They're attracted by the sweet smell where brothers and sisters live together in unity, there they are attracted to each other. Love lives there. There other people too notice the sweet aroma of the Spirit of Christ. He gives rest, peace, hope again in the middle of a life here which is so easily assaulted by all kinds of temptations and distractions and, and worries. What a blessing then to be with brothers and sisters in Christ in God's family in the dwelling place. And the psalm also mentions the dew of Hermon. Now, Hermon was that, a mountain that caused the dew to fall on the dry mountains of Zion because of the climate, the way the winds blew. It caused the dew to fall on Zion, which was dry. 
and it made things grow there. It's a metaphor for growth, which God gives from above through the Spirit of Christ. Growth in holiness, growth in love, growth in desire to glorify God. Fruits of thankfulness, growth in that too. That's another blessing that the Lord has commanded. Do you see, congregation, how important, but then also how good it is to dwell together in unity as it says in the first verse of Psalm 133, God commands blessing in life forevermore for his family. We so easily take it for granted that we belong to God's family and then we get annoyed with this and complain about that and this person rubs you the wrong way and then you so easily end up some, with some issue in, in the family and brothers and sisters who have opposing views can dig in their heels and then instead of God's family, the church can become more of a hotel where everybody just walks by each other. I, and then the devil rubs his hands. He doesn't want to see God and Christ glorified. He doesn't want prayers to be offered up to one another and for all. He doesn't want love to grow. And there's no sweet smell anymore. No growth, no blessing then. No congregation. We need to watch and pray that brotherly love may continue, as it says in Hebrews 13. And then the Lord will also command those spiritual blessings to descend on his family here. They'll be for his family here. And then all the members here, too, will grow in the desire for that greatest blessing of all which Christ obtained for his brothers and sisters, as mentioned at the very end of this psalm life forevermore. Amen.